what are the implications between now and 2030 over the next 15 years? How do we increase substantially the recruitment, development, training, and retention? But perhaps most important, what kind of evidence or experiences can we draw upon so that what we achieve uh, becomes useful? And that has meant we've gone through a number of the work in the past, the documents, some of them look at the future through the Sustainable uh, Development Goals, uh, which hopefully in September will be adopted uh, by the UN. And these, as well as other work, have guided our thinking as to how we proceed. How to introduce and finance health service delivery for children and child health in a context where many countries are graduating from lower income status to middle income status. So looking at mechanisms for sustainable financing of these services. I'll quickly go over the what, the how, and the who of the GFF. So, what is the GFF? The Global Financing Facility is a mechanism to orient resources towards smart, scaled, and sustainable financing for results in health, right? So what do we mean by smart financing? The interventions that will be financed by the GFF will be focused on evidence-based, high-impact interventions that are linked to results. So this does mean there will be a focus on results-based financing interventions, such as performance-based financing, conditional cash transfers, supply side and demand side, but that doesn't mean that it's exclusive to this. The objective of the GFF is to have a comprehensive approach to reinforcing health service delivery in the health systems. So this also means contributing and supporting non-RBF traditional input financing for improving outcomes. So we have programs in 35 of the least developed countries. We've trained over 40,000 health workers, reaching over 11 million people, which is a huge, um, you know, a huge level of impact. And most importantly, those health workers are helping to reduce morbidity and mortality in those countries. It's good to remind ourselves where do we sit with the health financing. And we can remember that uh, even the community health worker programs actually are part of the health systems. And we have to look at the entire health systems delivery to look at the functions of health financing. And it is one of the six uh, building blocks, uh, which usually uh, is more of an upstream where we can have more inputs uh, needed to actually deliver services. But there are actually three key main functions for the health financing. And we can have an example of this community health focus program. The first one is actually to do the resource mobilization. And how do we finance this new program, new interventions, considering the other elements of the health systems? including you know, hospitals, clinics, and so forth. And that's where we will see uh, innovative ways of doing business. We have heard this morning about the global uh, facility and other mechanisms where we can actually uh, mobilize more resources, domestic funding, uh, taxation, and so forth. The second function of the health is how do we pull these resources together? And there are different mechanisms, and certainly it's not easy. Uh, we will be uh, talking about uh, community health-based health insurance will be one of the mechanisms to pull the resources together. And then lastly, how do we pay and purchase services that we need? If we consider for the community health workers, uh, we know the interventions that are needed. We could use different approaches, and one of them would be uh, using the result-based financing approach. So when we, when the national program did the evaluation uh, in 2012 and 2013, I think, we realized that the services that were provided were so underutilized. So we wanted to understand why. It's, and we did a qualitative study and we saw that the services she provides did not respond to the community's needs because she only treats sickness with four under five children. And if the mother has fever, she is not allowed to treat the mother. She is treating only the sick child. And many, 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 many other capabilities she has that is not allowed within the program. So um, there are many different tools out there. Um, but there was no tool really for community health worker costing. Next, please. 
Um, and yet a tool for that is very important in many ways. A costing tool for me is not something you do after you've done the plan. It's something you do as part of the planning. Your costing projections should be on the screen in the same room that you're doing the planning because that is part of the planning. It's, if you make a good costing tool, it helps you to advocate for money. It also helps you to figure out what are the most cost-effective and efficient strategies and how to allocate resources equitably. So if you do a nice job of cost modeling in the beginning, it will serve you for many different functions and you will find over time that you will rely on it heavily. It will help you to answer the questions from the Ministry of Finance um, about what the money can be used for and what it will produce. Next. Um, the costing that we talk about is different from budgeting. A quick example is that when you make a typical budget, you've already decided what you're going to do and you're figuring out how many medicines, etc., you want to use. But it's a dead document. Because if somebody says, what if we increase, what if we double the number of treatments, what will happen? You have to go back into the budget and do it all again. So what we work in, and the community health work costing tool is an example of that, is a dynamic tool. So there are a few small variables, like the population, like your treatment targets. If you change those, everything else in the tool will change immediately. Can we ask the beneficiaries to tell us in their own words how they're going to do to improve X to uh, Y. So that's part of that contract under the same. Uh, global health security is now a, uh, a very hot topic on the global agenda, not just in the world of global health, but in the world of uh, global security. So global security and the contribution of health to achieving global security is very important. Uh, President Obama has had uh, conferences with uh, many of the leaders from your own countries on health security. There are many papers about it. There's a lot of donor interest in going into how we can achieve health security. And um, we think about uh, the control of uh, epidemics like Ebola as requiring the very expensive sorts of uh, uh, interventions that we've seen on the news uh, that are all very important, and I don't want to downplay the importance of them. But in reality, the most important part of this is detecting the epidemic early on before it gets out of control. And um, this is where community health workers come in. What I'm going to try to do in my uh, few minutes is to give a very brief introduction to cost effectiveness and cost benefit analyses and show how those techniques can help us looking at the design and financing of community health, uh, uh, community health worker programs. So uh, first, what are cost effectiveness and cost benefit analyses? They're two related tools that inform the allocation of scarce uh, resources, such as the budget of a Ministry of Health or the time and goodwill of members of the community who are being asked to volunteer some of their time. So firstly, on the uh, investment case, just to say that this is, uh, this is in some ways a conceptual framework for how, again, you might want to think about an investment case. Obviously, all the analysis you have to do uh, at the country level and with country specific uh, data, but hopefully again, this is a useful input to structure some of the detailed thinking and analysis you may want to do. We've identified four pillars for this case for investment, and they include the following. Firstly, it's a CHWs are a requirement to achieve critical global health objectives. So it's basically the right thing to do from a health impact perspective. Secondly, there are significant long-term economic returns from investments in CHW programs. And this is where we've tried at the Africa level to come up with a dollar amount against an investment. Thirdly, there are short-term cost savings um, arising from investments in CHWs. So basically you invest in an intervention delivered by CHWs and you have savings in other parts of your health system. And then lastly, there are further benefits to the society for example, women empowerment or the ability to collect data, like Henry mentioned, which are important for you to consider and to point out. Community health worker systems are necessary features 
of effective health systems. They're necessary, they're not optional. But they are systems, and so if they are handled in an unsystematic way, you won't get very good results from them. And that's why I think often we don't see them as important and useful as they can be, because if they're viewed as a, a free add-on, and David was just mentioning this, they're going to only be able to do a very, very tiny fraction of what they can do. If they're not used for curative care, for example, providing malaria medicines in the case of a confirmed malaria episode, it's an incredible waste. Because now we have the capacity to have a rapid diagnostic test in the community and to prescribe the medicines in the community and to avoid the long, difficult, dangerous, and often late trek to the facility. And so losing that opportunity is losing the whole point, actually. So for me, I don't see this debate as a continuing debate. I think technology has completely overtaken this debate. Community health workers can save lives in the field if they're not given logistics, supervision, medicines, provisioning, training, well, then you won't get results. Oh my God, you know, my people, 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 my